Hello doctors, so today we are going to be discussing history and physical exam in ob -GYN. and as usual I want you guys to know that instead of doing a complete overhaul of OB and gynecology, which I know that you guys are super confident in thanks to your third year studies, I'm just going to be highlighting the differences between taking a history and doing your PE in this subspecialty versus other specialties like usual. So with that said, first I want you guys to remember or think about what makes the pregnant population and also in general the female population different from other populations that we deal with in medicine. So there are certain things, specific considerations within these populations that we have to think about when we do a history and physical exam. So first of all, last menstrual period, always have to ask that. We need to denote whether or not the patient is sexually active, especially if the patient is a female of age who has a menstrual period. Sexual activity can predispose these patients or risk-taking behavior can predispose these patients to specific disease pathologies that we would not have thought about otherwise. And then also the presence or absence of pregnancy. So going back to our first question, when we think about what makes this population different, especially in the obstetrical population, of patients, we have to remember that there are not just one patient, there's technically two. You have the mother and the baby or the fetus. So in that way, you have to remember that there are a lot of physiological changes that occur due to pregnancy that can predispose the mother to specific pathological processes or that put a strain on the body that can create stress that leads to other manifestations of disease. So in addition to that, also remember that there are processes specific to pregnancy or the female genital tract that will be specific to this overt population. So again, important reminders for your discussion, your patient will always be biologically female. So as you would do in other rotations, when you present your case, you always say like the patient is a 27 year old female, chief complaint is headache. In OBGYN or ob your patient will always be biological female. So you can just say the patient is a 27 year old. You don't have to add female. You can say there's a 27 year old presents to the clinic with a chief complaint of headache. That will already like you will know that the patient is a female because your case is an obstetric case. If your tribe or tribunal wants you to state that, that's on them. But if, for me, the rule of thumb is if you have a tribunal that has an OB person on it and you get an OB-GYNA case, stating that the patient is a female is a big no-no. So you want to make sure you ask about gravidity and parity in all these cases because it's relevant. So knowing how many times the mother has been pregnant and knowing how many births she has completed to term, also TPAL, the term, preterm abortions, and live, those are all relevant to each of these ob gyne cases. And then make sure that you always, 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 always rule out pregnancy if it's applicable to the case. So for example, in a patient that presents with a chief complaint of amenorrhea, the first thing you want to do is rule out pregnancy. I received a question earlier in the month about when you would ask the tribe or when you would ask your panel to rule out pregnancy um, in the case of your discussion. So for me, if it's a female and is sexually active and pregnancy is a possible differential, you would say in your discussion when you start to talk about treatment and management, when, you're, when they ask about what you would use to diagnose this patient, you would say that you would request a pregnancy test in order to rule out pregnancy, especially, for example, if you're planning on giving a medication that could potentially harm the fetus or cause delays in development. So again, starting off with general data, I know that you guys know this already, just flashing this on the screen because the more that you see it, the easier it is to remember. So always, always, always start with general data. Note that there is no gender on the screen because again, in obstetrics and gynecology, your patient will 100% be a biological female. Okay, so also note that in general data, they have the, the hits, your medical surgical history up there already because the focus when you're doing your HPI and ob gyne is different. So moving forward, we have the obstetrical history next. So again, a quick review, gravidity and parity. So the gravida number, so it's G 
number is the number of total pregnancies. So that's how many times the mom has been pregnant. Para number, P number, that's the number of pregnancies that the mom has carried to term. So that does not include T-PAL. T is term, preterm, abortion, and living. So the para number does not include aborted fetuses, does not include preterm births. It really includes the number of pregnancies carried to term. And I know that you guys have a list of the parameters that are used to judge what is term, preterm, abortion, living, and how they fit into the GP number. So make sure that you review those before you go into your Avalida. For each pregnancy, you have to ask when the pregnancy was. Usually this is just a year, but some of the mothers know more than that and more specifically than that. The number of pregnancies, for example, if there were twins or like if, you know, she had gotten pregnant more than one time that year, you just want to make sure that you know how many fetuses there were or in that year how many times she was pregnant. You want to know how her labor was, if there were complications, and how long it was, and then any issues postpartum. So that's in the purparium. Finally, you want to move on to menstrual history, which I use Midas. Um, I know you guys have learned this already, but going over in a quick review, the menarche interval, duration, amount, and symptoms. So menarche is when the patient had her first period. Interval is how often, so that's like monthly. That will also, you can tie in regularity there as well. Duration is how many days her period lasts. Amount is how much, usually measured in the form of pads per day or tampons per day. And then her symptoms, so this is if she has anything like dysmenorrhea, body malay, fatigue, things like that. And then you want to know her past menstrual period, so that's two periods before basically the visit and her last menstrual period. So her LMP would be whether or not her most recent period. LMP is your most recent period. The past menstrual period is before the LMP. So that's like one before that. So basically you're asking for the last two period dates. Most of the time it's easy now. People have apps or they write them down or they use the calendar method. A lot of women I know are very on point with tracking their period, but um, there are instances where they won't know. So in that case, you can just ask for a ballpark uh, estimate of, for example, if her last menstrual period was June 1st to June 4th and she doesn't remember her past menstrual period, you can ask, did you have one in May? Did you have one in April? And then ask her about what week, the first week or the second week, and then do you remember how long it was? So that's how you would investigate a person who does not remember the exact dates of her period. Looking at her present pregnancy, so this is for an obstetrical case. When she comes in, usually it's a follow-up or a well visit to just check the progress of the pregnancy. The first thing you do is you check the estimated date of delivery calculated from the LMP, which is the most accurate method, until, of course, there is an ultrasound. But if there's a discrepancy between the LMP and the ultrasound, and please check me on this, but from what I remember, if there's a discrepancy between the LMP and the ultrasound, we always go based off the LMP because there can be issues with ultrasound estimations, especially with regard to positioning, the crown rump length, and things like that. So EDD is always calculated from the LMP, and you should do that on your own, even if it says... EDD is this date. They're going to check if you calculate the LMP by yourself. So make sure to do that on your own. Then you ask if they have experienced quickening, if, of course, it's applicable. So if the patient is like 12 weeks or eight weeks along, you would not ask if they have experienced quickening because they obviously would not have had quickening yet. So you can ask them when did they experience it for the first time, about how many weeks were they, and then how often they feel the baby moving, or like if the baby is super active or not as active as they think. And then again, move, move forward into asking, like, do you continuously feel the baby moving? Or, you know, you want them to know if it's like, do they feel like it's an over amount of movement? Do they feel like the baby's not moving enough? So you want to know how they feel about it, basically, or how they perceive the quickening. Next, you want to ask um, the date, the weeks of gestation. So the date would be the date of their clinic visit because this is usually tabulated. So you can see the progress from, from appointment to appointment. Weeks of gestation via the LMP or ultrasound again. Fundal height. So you guys know how to measure the fundic height. Remember to check your landmarks. 
and also when the fundic height is associated with the weeks of gestation, as well as um, certain disease processes that will affect the fundic height. So you guys want to go over that. And then finally, vital signs for this portion would be just BP and weights. You are going to ask the mother about the danger signs of pregnancy, which again are nausea, vomiting, headache, dizziness, visual disturbances, edema, urinary output changes, and vaginal bleeding. And then you would do your Leopold's maneuvers. So you want to check presentation. If the baby's big enough, you would do presentation, engagement, and position, and then listen for the fetal heartbeat. In a theoretical case, some of this information will most likely be given to you. So you want to make sure that you just know what things will mean. So if, for example, the Leopold's maneuvers are already given to you, you want to be able to say like, then this baby or this fetus is in this presentation or this um, position. So that's something that you're going to want to review, even though I know that you guys know it already. It doesn't hurt. So just a little graphic to help you guys remember the danger signs of pregnancy. I really, really love these little like infographics that they make. So this is something that I like to refer to because I don't like OB that much. So it's one of my, the harder topics for me. And I think that as much as, you know, you guys want to do your best to remember everything, sometimes it helps to put a physical or like a mental picture of what you're looking for. So... Danger signs of pregnancy, just real quick. All right, now moving on to the HPI. As always, like in every other rotation, this is based off of the chief complaint. So the one thing that you want to take note of is the onset and progress of the symptoms that the patient is experiencing. If the patient is there for follow-up, for example, it's just a well visit to check progress, you want to note any signs and symptoms that she may be experiencing or that may point to possible pathology. So that ties into our questioning of her present pregnancy. We also can check if she has come previously, like if she's been here already and this is not her first checkup, how her symptoms have changed, if there have been any changes, or if there is no change, then she's great. So also keep in mind during the time that you're doing this HPI, you want to keep in mind that the trimester of pregnancy that your patient is in and how far along she is, so how many weeks is the fetus, and whether or not what she is describing to you is normal for the current period of pregnancy. For example, if you have a patient who comes in in her first trimester, she's probably like eight weeks along and she complains of nausea and vomiting. And then she tells you, doc, it's not that bad. I vomit in the morning and then usually it goes away. Then we can say, write it off kind of as like, okay, you're probably just experiencing morning sickness and then counsel her as to like eat small frequent meals, try some blander foods, things like that. However, if the patient says now she's in her second trimester, she's felt quickening already at 16 weeks, it's her first baby, she cannot stop vomiting, she vo vomits in large amounts, she feels weak and dizzy, she's almost fainted a couple times, then we move into the kind of hyperemesis gravidarum where we know that's not really normal anymore because usually morning sickness only lasts for the first trimester and things like that. So you want to make sure that while you're taking this history, you keep in mind or note to yourself what trimester of pregnancy is my patient in and how far along is she because I want to make sure that whatever she's going through is normal for that period of time but is also safe, like the fetus also is safe. So if she has an infection, for example, you want to know like, okay, is this drug safe to give to my patient? Can I treat my patient with a specific drug? Will it affect the growth of my fetus? Will it affect the development? So those are things you wanna keep in mind. Physical examinations, usually normal um, for these patients. So you do height, usual weight, and present weight. That's to help keep track of growth, as well as you know the normal um, weight gain during pregnancy. So that's something you guys wanna check as well. Um, then you do your vital signs, temperature, BP, pulse, and respiratory rate. Finally, you move into your chest and abdomen, skin, extremities, and then you want to note any deformities that you may see on your initial physical examination. So this is just the basic physical exam that comes before doing the actual obstetrical physical exam. So again, I want to reiterate height and then usual weight. So that's like the weight before she was pregnant. 
present weight. So that way we can see the difference and how much she's gained per week. Usually that involves a little math. And then again, vital signs, chest, which is heart and lungs. You want to do a quick abdominal PE and then check her skin and extremities and then note if there are any deformities. Finally, moving down to obstetrics, you want to check the perineal area, which is external genitalia, labial folds. You want to check the coloring of the skin in the area, if there are any discharge or bleeding from the urethral and vaginal orifices, as well as scent, which sounds crazy, I know, but usually the smell, especially if it's a malodorous smell, can point us to specific pathology. So those are things that you want to keep in mind. With internal genitalia, for the pregnant person, you want to remember that there is no speculum exam done because we want as much as possible to prevent anything from entering the vaginal canal to cause infection. We don't want to break kind of that barrier, that safety net between the outside world and the amniotic sac. So we do not as much as possible do any speculum or internal examinations. Usually with the internal exam, you do it if needed only or if it's indicated, um, and that's just, you know, the usual finger IE with OB. So that's, for more often than not, it's not done because you want to make sure that, you know, you're, again, not helping infection to come into the birth canal. In gyne, you do both a speculum and internal examination. So finally, we're heading into our discussion so again, we start off with stating your initial impression. And then when you state your initial impression, you want to say how you came to this conclusion. So if we do something simpler, like for example, a patient presents with amenorrhea and she has not taken a pregnancy test yet. So you can set and you notice that she has physiological signs of pregnancy. She hasn't gotten her first ultrasound yet, but you feel like she is pregnant. You can say the patient uh, my initial impression is that this is a patient, the patient is pregnant, um, and you came to this conclusion because of the following. So you can list the signs and symptoms that your patient has experienced. If, for example, you did a PE and you were able to see some of those cervical signs because, you know, she wasn't sure if she's pregnant yet, then you could say that you saw a Chadwick sign, Hager sign, things like that. And then after that, you would transition into the discussion of your differential diagnoses, as we would do in any other case. So basically what differs in ob gyne other than the history in PE, is, is really just making sure that you're covering the information that will help lead you to your differentials. And the differentials will be different depending on what the patient is experiencing. So there's not really any major difference in the discussion portion except for drawing in the relevant obstetrical history or gynecological history. So those risk factors, you know, those are the things that you want to keep in mind when you're thinking about your differential diagnoses. So again, I'm just going to repeat it. It's the same as the others, but if you explain at least three differentials, two other diagnoses, including your most likely one, you discuss them in order of priority. For me, my most likely diagnosis is always last because it helps transition the establishment of my final diagnosis. That's just how I organize my thoughts when I present cases, and I think that it helps with the flow. Um, you discuss the differential why you considered it, and why you ultimately ruled it out. So, for example, if the patient with amenorrhea that we were talking about did a pregnancy test and was not pregnant, we could say that we would request uh, a pregnancy test, like a urine pregnancy test via the laboratory instead of like the usual um, pee stick test. And we ruled it out because that pregnancy test and ultrasound and or ultrasound came back negative. So that's something that we can do. Differential diagnoses can differ. So for amenorrhea, obviously, one of your um, things could be pregnancy. The other could be like, you know, ectopic pregnancy. And then the other could be probably like anemia or malnourishment, depending on the age of the patient. So those are things that you want to consider. Um, it could also be things like hypothyroidism or endocrinology. So a discussion in OB may not be confined to OB topics only. And that's something that I want you guys to remember because if you get a patient in OB who is actually sick, 
than, for example, like she's pregnant and then she has hypertension, you can say that perhaps it's preeclampsia, perhaps it's chronic hypertension, or maybe it's just gestational hypertension, but all of those differentials, you will have to relate them to the data that you gathered in your history of present illness. So the parameters that you, I know you guys know for the differences between gestational hypertension, chronic hypertension, and then preeclampsia or eclampsia, those are things that you are going to want to review so that you are able to make the differences when it counts at the end during the discussion of your case. Because that will be those like wow factors that will show your panel that you know exactly what you're talking about, that you use your data that you gathered and not just memorize a script for each case, and that you were able to come to this conclusion logically and rationally. So those are the things that you want to consider. When you establish your diagnosis, this is your moment. This is when you use your background clinical knowledge, you expand upon your explanation, and you are reasoning for the current diagnosis and your initial imp impression. And basically, you're explaining to your panel how you logically came about to this diagnosis. So you're you're trying you're not really trying to impress them because you're already impressive. You're explaining to them why this is what you're defending and why you 100% confidently believe in your skill as a clinician and this is what you diagnosed your patient with because you are the doctor. So again, you want to explain other variables that may not be covered by your initial impression. So if there are those like random pieces of the HPI or vital signs or PE that do not necessarily fit within your diagnosis, those are things that you can use to either strengthen your diagnosis or you can say that this is what you believe your diagnosis to be. However, you are aware of these other variables and you would order these diagnostic exams to further evaluate whether or not your diagnosis should or should not be changed. So in essence, you're sticking to your diagnosis. You're defending your diagnosis 100%. Like once you make a diagnosis, that's your diagnosis and defend it with your life. Um, but you do want to explain other variables if they come up that may not be covered by your initial logic or rationalization of your diagnostic pattern. In OB and gynae, again, parameters are important. So when you're looking at OB, the even with something as simple as hypertension when did the hypertension first occur was she already a hypertensive before she was pregnant did the hypertension occur in what trimester um does it you know those are all parameters that are important um, and you want to make sure that you know them so you also want to pay attention to like i said earlier the age of the fetus how far along is she the size of the fundic height is the growth pattern normal were there any ultrasound findings were there any pending routine diagnostic tests so again remember in ob we want to make sure that the patient gets her routine ultrasounds. And then when do we do the congenital scans? When do we do the biophysical assessments? So those are things that you're going to want to go over just to, I guess, kind of emphasize them to yourself so that you know the biophysical profiles and the congenital tests and all of the OGTTs and to make sure that to test for um, diabetes, uh, gestational diabetes. Those are things that you want to have in mind like how far along does the patient have to be before you test them for that or what are the exceptions to those rules like for example if my patient comes in she's symptomatic um, it's not yet like she's not yet in her second trimester but she's showing signs of you know diabetes or she's having symptoms of diabetes can i test her already with an ogtt or what would my initial exam be after the fbg or things like that so those are things that you want to make sure that you know so that they can help you. Not so that they can scare you and not so that it feels overwhelming, but the more information that you have at your fingertips, the stronger your case will be. So those are all things you want to go back and review so that you can make your case even stronger because I know that you guys have got this. So again, with treatment and management, you want to state the gold standard, talk about whether or not this treatment is available in the Philippines and whether or not we do it. Talk about if it's affordable, is it feasible, and if there is a better option, or if what we do in practice differs from the gold standard treatment, what do we actually do for these patients? So ask about or talk about would you admit this patient, why or why not, and then whether or not there needs to be follow-up and how often or when. Finally, with the prognosis, you want to talk about how does the diagnosis affect your patient, 
Is it curable? Are there long-term effects to my patient? Are there long-term effects to the fetus? Will there be permanent disability with my patient or the fetus? Ask about or talk about whether or not follow-up is required and when you would have the patient follow up. So that's also a prognosticating factor because you want to know if the will patient's compliance help better the prognosis? Usually the answer is yes, but especially in pregnancy, when a patient follows up, you're able to monitor them more closely, especially when they're high risk. So do you have them follow up more often or less often? So that's something that you want to consider, like especially when you're trying to classify your patient as high risk or not high risk, you want to keep the follow-up portion in mind. And then finally, with prognosis as well, I always throw in patient teaching and counseling. So you want to counsel the moms to, know, you know, don't smoke, eat right, as well as, you know, no intake of alcohol. What medications are you using? Are they using retinoids on their skin? Are they using, you know, other teratogens? Are they exposed to teratogens at all? Have they taken medication? Are they taking medication that could be a possible detriment to the fetus development? So those are things that you always want to talk about when you have an obstetric patient, especially if the patient is a new mom and doesn't necessarily know what to look out for yet. So after all is said and done and you close your case, you are killing it. Again, you have passed with flying colors, you close your case, you got your meritissimus, and you're an MD. So keep fighting, guys. I believe in you, and I know that you have got this. So thank you so much for listening, and happy studying.